What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And it's time to celebrate because it's the end of the series. Today's the last day. Oh, well, okay, that's, that's okay. It's a bit lame, but it was okay, yeah. It is the end of the series. And, and I, I think, you know, we've tried our best over these last few weeks, everybody who's, who's shared and talked, that we might as a church together catch and get a sense of what's in God's heart, that our focus might be off ourselves and onto the one. You know, the, the, the Lord Jesus is relentless in His pursuit of each one of us in this room. He never gives up on any of us. He never stops pursuing the best out of us. That we, the way we are today is not the way that He would want us to end up our lives. And there's that constant reaching out. There's that constant living for, searching for, uh, dying for the one. And we know that in, in Luke 15, 4, which has been our central verse for this whole series, where Jesus told that parable, He said, suppose a shepherd has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one lost sheep until he finds it? Aren't you grateful today that you have been that one lost sheep and you've been found? Are more than six of us grateful <laughs> that we've been found, that we were at one lost sheep and Jesus sought us and found us. And so, actually, we've been trying our best to communicate, can it be or could it be in 2018 that we would catch hold of the importance of what it means for us to reach out for the one, to live for the one, to search for the one, and to, to invest our lives in the one, not in this one, but in the other one. You know, it means for the shepherd, as you know, I guess changing the sense of value. It's changing the value from being self-centered to being other-centered. Aligning our values with God's towards other people. Aligning our values to the ones that are in our lives. You know, He places immense value on the one. Enough value that He might exchange His life, as it were, for your life on Calvary. So it needs us to change our values. It needs our direction uh, to, of our vision to change. That our, the directing of our vision is towards the one that as we go through our daily lives, Monday through Saturday, that our lives are focused and, and attuned to and aligned towards the ones in our lives. Could it be that we could have not only our values, the importance of the one change, but also the direct, direction of a vision of our lives changed as well? In actual fact, if we could do that, then we would indeed be activating the calling that is on your life and in my life. Because Matthew 28 encourages and commands us to go into all the world and reach the whole world, reach everyone with the good news of Jesus and what He's done for you and for me and how He's died for us. And so it's actually the calling it is on our life. It's not something we can shirk or put to the side. It actually, reaching the one is how you're designed to be and what God has called you to be. Tom gave us a wonderful illustration of how long it would take to, to reach the world if each one in here began reaching the ones in their life. I tried to make it a little bit easier for us and think about how long would it take for us to reach our city of 220,000 people if each of us in here reached one person in the next year. And then the next year, that one person and each of us reached another person. And in the third year, each of them and them and them and us reached somebody. It would only take us just over eight years. By 2026, the whole of our city would be reached for the gospel. Possible or impossible, huh? Starts in here. If you can change your values, direct your vision differently, and be activated in the calling that God has got. We've been looking at John's gospel, I guess, and these seven miraculous signs that John, I guess, signposts throughout. He signposts throughout his letter written at the end of the first century, just so that we might get a, an understanding. And of course, it comes down to what he says at the very end chapter, in chapter 20 and verse 31. He says, that many signs, and particularly these seven, were written that you might believe that Jesus is indeed who he says he is, the Messiah the Son of God, and that by that believing you might live, have life in His name. It's about getting an understanding that we believe that He is who He says He is. That all of us in this room, by what God has done for us and who He is, we might believe that He is who He says. But it's not only about believing, it's about being like as well. That we might be like Him as well as believe in Him. 
and that our lives would be a, an illustration, our lives would be a picture, a demonstration of the character and the qualities of the Lord Jesus. And that's what we're called to do. That's why John wrote these letters, and that's why he put these seven signposts in there to point us in that direction. And we come to the last one today. Fantastic story, a story that you all know about. It's a story of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But it was more than actually raising Lazarus back to life. It was actually about restoring a broken family, a family that had been split apart by the death of their brother, a family whose future was no longer certain because the breadwinner, the earner, was now gone, a family whose, whose future was no longer going to be secure. So it was about restoring a broken family. It was about reframing a future that had all of a sudden been lost. That, the, that, that which is going to be tomorrow had all been disappeared. But now, by Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, the future was refamed, and actually the faith that they had was rekindled and revived again. And maybe you're in some of those places today. Maybe it's your family that's sitting here broken today. Maybe it's your family, for whatever reason, that is torn apart today. Then maybe there'll be something in this today that will help you to come again to that place of, of thank you, Lord Jesus that you have looked out for the one and my family can be restored. Maybe that your faith has gone cold and it needs to be revived today. Then I hope there's something in here for you also. Maybe that it's the uncertainty of your future that once again would be reframed. So let's go to chapter 11 and we'll read it together. Open up your phone and, and let's get the Bible on your phone or, or you maybe have an old-fashioned thing called paper and we can have a look at that too. We just want to read the story because it's a fantastic story. It takes place in this little village called Bethany, more of a hamlet, I guess, just maybe a couple of miles from east of Jerusalem. And in that little hamlet was a home by these three people, Mary, Martha, the two sisters, and their brother, Lazarus. It had become a place where Jesus would find rest and find a place where he could just kick back and, and enjoy their company where he could enjoy a good meal and have a good laugh and be a place where he can retreat to, a place like all of us need a place where we can retreat to, a place where we can relax and be ourselves, a place where, where we know that we can be known and be known, a kind of like a connect group, I guess. But here it was in this little uh, village home that this story takes place, a story of great sadness. It says, there was a man named Lazarus and he was sick. And he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus was now lay sick, that was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus via a messenger, Lord, the one you love is sick. Jesus at this time had been threatened by being stoned by the leaders of the, the temple. And they didn't like what he was saying and what he was doing. And so he moved with two days' journey uh, to, across the Jordan. And he was there when this messenger arrived with a story about his friend and this family that he loved, and the one that he loved was sick. When Jesus heard this, he gave a message back to the sisters and said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Only then did he say to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? Jesus answered, you know what? Are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by his world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he'd said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. But Jesus had been speaking about his death, but his disciples just thought he meant natural sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Then Thomas, called the twin or Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let's go also, that we might die with him. And on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Some professional mourners, family and friends, I guess, had come around. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. 
But I know that even now God will give whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said. He's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had gone out to meet him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she had, was going to the tomb to mourn her brother there. But when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and he was troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not have you opened the eyes of the blind man, kept this man from dying? Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave like all of them in that first century with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor for he's been there four days. I love what the King James says. It says, he stinketh. He stinketh. There was a pong. Jesus, don't open that stone. There's going to be a pong. The body is decomposing. It's going through this natural process. It's a warm country, Jesus. Don't you know? And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of people standing here, that they believe that you sent me. And when he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. Fantastic story. Just an amazing story. And I know that sometimes we think, eh, wow, I wonder if I could be true. Isn't it interesting that nobody refutes this story? Now the disciples, none of the people who are, are the, the church leaders, nobody refutes this story. They, they do something about the fact that it's happened, but nobody says this is not true. It's a great story for you and me. And just simply over these next few moments as we wrap up this series and try to once again just nail home this whole truth a bit, could it be that we could reach the one? I believe that God wants to say to each one, each one of us in here, it's never too late to reach the one. It's never too late to reach the one. There may be ones in your life and you're thinking, well, it's a bit too late. They're old now and things are difficult. It's never too late. And maybe for your own life today, God would maybe say to you, you know what, it's never too late to be reached. It's never too late for God to do something new in your life. You may be old now and have seen a lot and gone through a lot and followed Jesus for a long time and think, hey, it's all straightforward. Every day is the same as the next day. No, can I say to you that he still wants to do some new stuff in your life. He still is looking for you as the one that he wants to do something new. It's never too late to reach out to the one. And there's three different kind of ones in here. There were the ones with no hope, Mary and Martha, that we'll look at in a moment. There was the ones with no clue, all these Jews who, who were the Klingons who came and, and were part of the, the story that were there. And are the ones with no life, Lazarus. What about the, these Mary and Martha then, the ones with no hope? Your hope is such a powerful component, isn't it? Hope expects a different future. Hope is the energy that we put into thinking about tomorrow. Hope is the thing that we, we galvanize in our own hearts to, to, to anticipate a different future ahead of us. But when hope begins to diminish and hope begins to get less, it's very challenging for us, as it was for these three ladies. And you can see that there's a pattern of diminishing hope, of erosion of hope that can so often be our situation, can so often be our circumstance. It starts with that journey of delay. When delay comes into our life, when that which we expect doesn't come to pass, when there's a gap between our expectations and our experience, 
When we define our expectations and our experience doesn't match that, the disappointment often is the outcome. When you and I expect something and it doesn't come through, then that's what the reality is, that sometimes we end up with hope being reduced and hope being diminished. I I would be shocked if there's not many people in here that are living in that place called delay, where you've got an expectation of a different future. You've got an expectation of a different experience happening ahead of you, and you're in that place called delay, where nothing is currently happening. And you don't know what is going to be the outcome of all this. What are my expectations going to be met or are they not? I've found in life that when we define and are very clear about our expectations and we make declarations about our expectations, it's not unusual for us to be a disappointed experience when it's not met. But we've got to be men and women full of expectancy because that's what God tells us. He's the one who's, who's settled the future. It's not as if the future is unknown. It's not as if where we're going is unknown. He's the one who's the victor. He knows where our future is. How wonderful is that? It's not a case of, well, it'll just happen. It's a case of it has happened. It happened on Calvary 2,000 years ago, and we can be sure and we can know that our future is secure. You and I need to be of all men most expectant of a positive outcome. My favorite verse in all of the New Testament is Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. It's a wonderful verse. It's a verse that says that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion when Jesus returns or when your life ends. That's a great verse of expectation, that he's not finished with me. And you're saying, amen, thank you for that. It's the same for all of us. He's not finished with any of us because he's got a plan and a purpose for our life. And we look at it with great expectancy. But I wonder how many are living in the place called delay. That dream of that hope, and it hasn't taken place. Mary and Martha were in that place where they were living in that place called delay. But you see, delay can often move to the place of disappointment, which they had. If you have worked out the time frame as we were just reading the story, you see that the messenger arrives at Jesus, and Jesus is two days away from Bethany. Messenger comes, and he gives his message and says that the one you love is sick. Jesus said, don't worry, this is not going to be till death. Back you go and tell him. He takes another two days and goes back. It then says that Jesus stays there for two days, and he arrives when the body's been there four days. So it's not a rocket science. Just it's needed to work out that as the man, mess, the messenger, arrives back in the home of Mary and Martha, that Lazarus is already dead. But the messenger, can you just imagine him bursting through the door with his message from Jesus, full of excitement, with Jesus' words that says, this is not, this sickness will not end in death. He's got it. He's maybe got it written down. He's running with all his might. He's going with all his passion. He's so excited, and he bursts into the room, and he's about to say, the sickness is not unto death, and he sees Lazarus, the corpse, there in front of him. You know what happens in those disappointments when the situation says something different to your expectations, when the circumstances and the reality of your life say something different to what you hoped it would be, when that which you're living in is not what you hoped you'd be living in, that relationship you're in is not outworked the way you thought it would, that job that you're in is not actually how you p- proposed and hoped it would be, that person that you spent all your life with doesn't turn out being the one that you thought they were, that financial situation that you find yourself in at the moment, that's not how you thought it would be. The things that you've done in the past have brought you to where you are today, and you never thought your life was going to be there. It ends up in this place called disappointment, and hope shrinks even further as it did for Mary and Martha. A life full of if-onlys. And they say to Jesus, if only you'd been here. You can imagine it. Martha says, if only you'd been here, Jesus, things would have been different. While you see Mary at his feet saying, if only you'd been here. Many of us fall in either camp. We're either the if only you'd done this or if only you'd done this. But whatever way many of us fill our lives with, if only this had happened, if only I'd been born differently, if only I'd had different parents, if only I'd had a different background, if only my life had been different, if only I hadn't had that decision, if only I hadn't had that influence, and we arrive at a place where the situation is not where we thought it was going to be. We thought it was going to be a promise and it was going to be great. I remember the day that I got married. You remember those days you got married, all of you that are married? Do you take this woman for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death is due part? You say it, but you think it's going to be better and better, richer and richer, healthier and healthier, 
bigger and bigger, weller and weller. You don't think of the poor bit. You don't think of the difficult bit. You don't expect that. You think that your married life is going to be great, and then five days in, boom. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> She's downstairs. It's okay. We'll, we'll keep it a secret, won't we? Disappointment. Disappointment. And hope shrinks. But you see, hope didn't only shrink to disappointment. Hope shrank to despair. Because they came to that place where their convictions began to be questioned. What do I really believe? Are you really the promise-keeping God? Are you really the one who can make things different? Are you really the one who is for me and not against me? You said you loved us, Jesus, but you didn't show. You said you loved us, and yet you couldn't bring my brother to wellness again. We get to that place where we think it's really, really impossible. It's called fourth day faith. I don't know if you've heard of fourth, fourth day faith. It's the other coin of fourth day failure. You see, this was the fourth day which was very significant for everybody around Bethany at the time. The whole town would have known that it was now the fourth day. You see, they believed that when you died, you were buried on the same day. Just as you see sometimes in the television at the moment, if somebody dies in the Middle East, then quickly the body is taken and the body is, is buried. That was because Hebrew thought was that the soul lingered around the body perhaps for three days. And it lingered and perhaps would go back into the body on day one. It perhaps would go back into the body on day two. Maybe even it would stretch as far as going back into the body on day three. But the soul disappeared on day four because that's when decomposition was very significant. And when decomposition became, the body began to disintegrate. And as it disintegrated, the soul had to leave. Mary and Martha would have known, everybody in that mourning community would have known that this is now the fourth day. We're now into the realm of impossible. We're now into the realm of officially impossible. There is now nothing that can be done. Maybe where there would have been a chance before, hey, it was a great miracle when Jairus' daughter was, 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 made well, uh, was made well again. It was a great miracle when the woman, widow of Nain's son was made well again, and both of them died, but they were res, raised by Jesus on the same day. This was now day four. It was now officially impossible. The full stop had been said. The exclamation mark was written. There was no different future. I don't know how many in here today, you're thinking, this is my lot. There is no different future. This is where I'm going to be, and this is the trajectory trajectory of my life, and this is what it's going to be like. This is, it's, in, un, it's now officially impossible for God to change my world around. And you live with that shattered hope and despair. It may be a diagnosis that somebody has labeled you with. It may be symptoms that you carry. It may be a consistent habit that you have. It may be a lifestyle or a mindset that you have. It may be a relationship that is, is, is tearing you apart, whatever it is, you come to that place and you think, this is it, this is my lot, it's a full stop. I want to tell you today that that's not the case. Your hope may have shrunk. Your hope may be full of delay. Your hope may be shrinking because of despair or because of disappointment. I need to tell you today that Jesus Christ is the one who, is the, uh, uh, the one who brings all hope to us. We just need a different perspective. All of us just need a different perspective this morning. You see, Jesus arrived and He knew what was going to happen. He knew what the outcome was. He knew what the future was. He knew what the, the, the end result was going to be. Oh, if only Mary and Martha had known that, then their hope would have expanded. Their hope would have enlarged. All you need to know is a different perspective today that is an eternal perspective on your life and on my life. If we could get a hold of that today, then hope would continue to rise. Hallelujah. If you and I could get a perspective on how God sees your life, and God sees your future, and God sees your delays, and God sees your disappointments, and God perhaps even sees the despair of the full stops that you've made, He wants to tell you today, take a different look, lift up your head, and see that He's in control, and He's ordering your affairs, and He's the omnipotent God in charge of your world. Hallelujah. He does have a plan. He does have a purpose. He is working things through in your life. I love how he comes right into their presence, even in the midst of disappointment, even in the midst of delay. He never leaves them or forsakes them. And that's our God. He never, ever leaves you. It may feel as though you are from your perspective, but he is always there. That's our God. So if you're in here today and you're the ones with no hope, God is looking for you today. Jesus' eyes are towards you today. If you're sitting here and you're in a place where your hope is shrunk, be encouraged today because He's for you and His eye is on you and He's reaching out to you today. The ones with no hope need to hurry. The ones with no clue 
See, many were in this environment, but they had no clue, they had no understanding, they had no revelation of exactly what was going on. All these professional mourners had been, come in from Jerusalem. Others had come around, I guess, and were aware of what was going on, but actually didn't comprehend that there was a bigger story being written. Didn't understand what was happening in the midst of all the emotion. They were caught up in the emotion, caught up in the commotion, but never a sense of comprehension of actually what was happen, happening. They were there to comfort, but not willing to be confronted. They were there, I guess, to happy to make some comments here and there, happy to make a comment about, look how he, he loves them, but yet also to make a comment about why has he not brought them back to life. I'm happy to make comments, but not to make commitments. And week by week in your world and my world, we're surrounded by wonderful people, wonderful people who've got a great heart, wonderful people who've got a, a, just a, a, a wonderful sense of, of being the best human they possibly can be, not nasty people, not horrible people, nice people, good people. And it breaks my heart because they're there and they're the ones with no clue. No clue that Jesus has died for them. No clue that it's just a prayer away inviting them into our life and transforming their future. No clue that their fears can be removed. No clue that the peace, they can have the peace that passes all human understanding. No clue that they can be filled with joy because of what Jesus has done for them. No clue that there's a God who loves them and is interested in them and has got a great life ahead of them. Not an easy life, but a great life, a wonderful adventure. In this room today, maybe there's some in here and you've come and you've been part of the commotion, part of what's going on here, but you're sitting here without a revelation. You're sitting here without a, 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 a comprehension that Jesus actually loves you, that God loves you so much that He sent His one and only Son to die for you. You're the one that He died for today. I love that reality that Jesus has got a heart for the ones with no clue. You know, this main story is not actually about Lazarus. He's, the, he's, the, he's almost the, the, the guy who shows up in the last act. It's mainly about Mary and Martha and the interaction between Jesus and Mary and Martha. And yet, peppered throughout the story are these people, they, the Jews, many Jews. And I love how the fact that Jesus engages with them because he realizes they're the ones with no clue. But how does he do that? He invites them into his world. Jesus becomes, I mean, I don't know how you can, you can put it any other way, but I don't know how, what you, your perception is, but, but God weeps. Jesus weeps. He gets emotionally engaged and involved in this process. He gets overtaken by his emotions. Not out of control, but his emotions are set free and loose. He's totally vulnerable in front of all of these Jews that are there. And they watch him and they see him weep because his heart is breaking for the situation. They watch him getting indignant because of the pain and the anguish that is evident before him. They watch him as he's all troubled and shook up because of what is going on. They see, I guess, as Jesus says, I will invite you into my world to see exactly the reality of what this means to me. How wonderful that our God still does that. He still invites you and I into a discovery journey of who He really is like and what His heart breaks for and who He is on our behalf. Oh, that we would do the same for those that are in your world, the ones with no clue in your office tomorrow morning, the ones with no clue in the shop that you go to, the ones that have no clue in the place of your work. Why don't you invite them into your world to see who you really are? What are you demonstrating? Are you demonstrating the life of Jesus? Are they able to say, why do you have a faith like this? Why are you like this? Are you able to do that? Jesus invites them in, and then he invests in them and gets them involved by moving stones and, and stuff. The ones with no clue. And I love verse 47, I think it is. Forgive me, like find the, the, the verse. It says here in verse 45, Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in them. Wouldn't that be amazing if you give, are able to give a story that many of the ones who have no clue in your life discover who you really are and put their trust in Jesus Christ. Come on. Amazing stuff. The ones with no hope, the ones with no clue, and the one with no life. Sickness had come into his life. We don't know what that was. We don't know if it was internal dysfunction, if he'd some system disorder, or if there was something going on. 
pathologically inside, or we don't know if it was something from the outside, if he'd been infected with cholera, or, or if he'd picked up some polio virus. Or, we don't know what it was that he contracted or what was going on inside. But whatever was going on, he became sick and unwell, and that sickness continued until the place of death, till the place where every cellular function in his body stopped, where all the systems shut down, where he then was unresponsive. He was not able to respond to circumstances around him. No contribution was able to be made. You know what? I think all of us need to get an understanding and a reality of the brevity of life. None of us are guaranteed a sick, free life. That's why I gave out man flu sweeties today to men to keep them fit and healthy. None of us are guaranteed that. We can make some great choices that will help us be healthy. But it's the human condition, I'm afraid. And all of us are going to head in that journey. And some pathology is going to get us. That's the reality. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He's the reversal. He's the one who can reverse. But I believe that for Lazarus, he was the one with no life. Where everybody would say, it's too late, Jesus. It's too late. You can't make any difference here. He's now dead. In fact, he stinketh. Hey, the picture, I guess, is as radical as this for us in 21st century. It would be like the cremation has just taken place. And they're just about to bury the little box of ashes. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Hold on a minute. Lazarus, come forth. And that decomposed corpse becomes alive again and walks out. Hallelujah. Come on. It is amazing. Easy for us sometimes to think of bodies that are resurrected, but this is decomposed to the degree of cremated. You know, I guess all of us in this room at some point perhaps were spiritually alive and well, had that spiritual vitality going on in our life. I wonder if sickness has got us. I wonder how many of us in this room today have journeyed down that place of sickness. Maybe you're in that place now where you'd actually say, well, Ian, you know, there's not much spiritual life going on within me at the moment. Maybe I've even come to that place of spiritual death where I'm not alive to Jesus anymore. And there's a great big boulder that's rolled in front, and I'm, this is my lot. And it's too late now for God to do anything for me. Hey, we know that only God is the one who can bring life again. He's the only one who can breathe life into you and I. He is the resurrection and the life. We need His Holy Spirit to breathe into you and I. And as He exhaled, Lazarus come forth, that body inhaled the Holy Spirit again, came alive again, and wonderful. And we need, that. we need to pray for the ones in our lives that we know are not alive. And there may well be some in here today, and you've never come alive to God. You've never had that spiritual life. And today God would say to you, I, I am the resurrection and the life. God would say, He is the resurrection and the life. He is the one who can bring life to you today. He can speak that life and declare, declare that life over you today. Our role, what's our role? I believe that we are bolder rollers and binder releases. Boulder rollers and binder releases. Boulder rollers because there are many stones that come in front of people who are not spiritual alive anymore. Once they were vitally alive, but now a boulder has been rolled across. You know, the boulder wasn't there to keep Jesus out. It was to let Laz it wasn't to keep let Jesus in. It was to let Lazarus out. There's no problem with the, the one who's the, the giver of life giving life anywhere and everywhere. He could speak the word and it would be done. It was actually so that the, the one who was dead might be make that contact with God. Sometimes when we become spiritually dead, it's us who doesn't want the contact with the living God. It's us who doesn't want that contact. Why? Because there's a boulder of disappointment in front. Everything that's gone on in your life before, all the sad things that have happened to you, all the disappointments, that which your dreams you had have never come, the hopes that have been dashed, it rolls as a boulder in front of you, and you now get to that place where, where the, the, the spiritual non-aliveness that you now have is unable to communicate with God. It may be the boulder of resentment. You've been offended in the past. Somebody said something that maybe have hurt you, done an action or done something to you, perhaps not by their intent, but whatever, it, it was alive, arrived at you as offense. And when you get that resentment, it rises. It's like a boulder that runs in front. And the desire to become alive again is thwarted by the barrier of resentment. 
For some, I guess it's the barrier of contentment, the stone of contentment. You're just happy being where you're at. And God has got so much more for you. The life that you now have, He wants to bring it alive even more. He wants to put more vitality into you. He wants to put more life into you. He wants to bring you alive and fully alive. John 10.10, 10, the abundant life. But we sit there with a boulder of contentment rolled in front. That Don't bother me. I'm happy with the life that I currently have. I wonder if there's a boulder in front of your life today. I wonder if behind that boulder is a life that is not as alive as it once was. Or today God wants to call out your name. You know, for the story here, it was a personal call. Yeah, we hear lots of times that if Jesus hadn't said Lazarus, then every dead corpse in in, uh, Bethany would have risen up and come out. That may be true. But all I do know was it was a personal call. It was to Lazarus come out. And today I believe that God has got a personal call, certainly for the ones in our city, but He's got a personal call perhaps for some in this room today. You know where you're at today. You know what your spiritual life is like. You know how alive it is. You know how it once used to be alive. Where is it now? Maybe you're in here today as the one with no hope. Ian, you don't know my circumstances. I don't, but God does. Maybe you're the ones with no clue. Oh, I pray today that the God of the universe would bring increased revelation through His Son, Jesus Christ, into your life, that you may get an understanding of how great is this God that we serve and His Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life for each one of us. Sad story for all of us, I think, is that so many people didn't get that revelation that day. And it says that many went on and they saw the miracle, experienced the transformation, and yet went off to the Pharisees, and it started a cascade that would end up in Jesus being crucified. They rejected that which they'd seen, that which they knew, that which they understood, and yet they still rejected it. Oh, for everybody in this room today, I trust that you don't reject this wonderful Savior. I trust that you accept His invitation, His personal call to come alive today, His personal call to come out from the death that is the life you're living at the moment, to be unwrapped from everything that has been your past and be set free for a phenomenal future that He's got for you. Come on, let's, let's pray together for a moment, can we?